Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Michelle Storms. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm the executive director at the ACLU of Washington. I'm speaking to you from the traditional land of the first people of Seattle, the Coast Salish people, who have stewarded this land for generations. Our ACLU office downtown sits on the unceded territory of the Duwamish people. By this acknowledgement, we remember the role our country played in the stripping of indigenous land, culture, and language, and we recognize there is much work we need to do to make this country fair for all people, and we continuously commit to doing that work. You are here this evening for our first Flights and Rights of 2021. We originally started doing these when Trump took office as president in 2016. At that time, we got a lot of new members to the ACLU, and we wanted to create a venue to not only keep you all apprised of our work, but give us a way to build genuine relationship with you and share ideas with you on how to support this vital work for equity and justice and democracy in our state and in our country. In the early years, our flights and rights events were typically hosted in breweries and event spaces around the state, most often the gathering space of KEXP 90.3 FM in Seattle, KEXP.org. KEXP has been an important and valued partner over the years uh, with this, with this uh, event. But even though we can't be together in person, um, we still bring flights to go with your rights. So if you're in the Seattle area, please visit Lucky Envelope Brewery and mention the ACLU for $5 off beer to go. There should be a link in the chat box for you to see. You can also check out our website for more details and you can see some of the other uh, partners that we've had in this event in the past. Also, everyone in attendance tonight has been entered into an ACLU of Washington Supreme Swag giveaway. Um, all kinds of treats that you can't get anywhere else. So we'll draw names after the event and notify three lucky winners by email tomorrow. Well, folks, it has been a long four years and a long few weeks, right? We got through Inauguration Day peacefully, but that does not end the fact that there's a significant cross section of our country that feels there was a stolen election and that the current administration is not legitimate and that only a revolutionary overthrow will cure the problem. Institutional racism and the desire to maintain systems which continue to oppress people of color and others who find themselves living in the margins is a significant contributor to what has unfolded. Many elected officials hold responsibility for allowing these lies to escalate to the point that some portion of the country feels the need to come to arms. So as those same complicit officials cry out that now is a time to heal and unite, we join with those who say it's a time for accountability. It takes accountability to be able to heal. I also say we still need to remember our own mental health and well-being. It has been a long haul and it's still a long haul to go to really have us reach a place where everyone can be free and fully exercise their rights and liberties. We're facing problems in our state and country that will not be solved overnight. So we have to continue to take care of ourselves and each other, minimize our stress as best we can, stay healthy and know that we're not in any of this alone. I encourage you to grab onto whatever gives you hope in this moment and do not let go of it. For example, the words of youth poet laureate, Amanda Gorman. So while once we asked, how could we possibly prevail over catastrophe? Now we assert, how could catastrophe possibly prevail over us? We will not march back to what was, but move to what shall be, a country that is bruised, but whole, benevolent, but bold, fierce and free. That just makes me feel good, just thinking about her and listening to those words. So now let me introduce tonight's program. We're talking technology and liberty this evening. All of our speakers are a part of the Tech Equity Coalition, a group of advocates who represent communities taking action to hold technologies accountable to people. First, we'll hear from Jennifer Lee. Jennifer is the technology and liberty manager at the ACLU of Washington. Jennifer joined the ACLU of Washington two years ago and works on pushing for transparent and accountable technology policies that center community voices. 
She has a master's in public policy from the University of Cambridge, a bachelor's degree in international studies, public health and sociology from Johns Hopkins University, and was previously a Google policy fellow where she worked on issues regarding genetic data, algorithmic disc discrimination and international privacy laws. Jennifer's job is to ensure that the explosion of technology in our society respects people's privacy, is fair and accountable to everyone and advances our constitutional rights and freedoms. We'll also hear tonight from Stan Shakuma. Stan is a social activist, writer and community organizer. He is president of the Seattle chapter of the Japanese American Citizens League, a national co-chair of Suru for Solidarity, an organizer for the Tool Lake Pilgrimage, co-editor of the monthly newsletter of the Nisei Veterans Committee, and a member of the Asian Pacific American Labor Alliance. As a longtime taiko drum player, he also performs, writes, and lectures on the history, teaching, and performance of taiko in North America. We'll also hear from Brianna Ofray. Brianna is the legal and policy manager and attorney at CARE Washington, Council on American, Elizabeth, Council on American Islamic Relations in Washington. She specializes in using creative legal and grassroots advocacy solutions to represent discriminated individuals and address systemic issues facing the American Muslim community, including racial profiling, police misconduct, hate crimes, national security and travel issues, immigration and employment discrimination. Finally, but not the least, Ashley Del Villar, will join us. Ashley is a community organizer with La Resistencia, Resistencia and Mi Gente. La Resistencia is a grassroots volunteer undocumented led group fighting alongside people detained at the Northwest Detention Center in Tacoma to end all detentions, deportations, and to shut down the Northwest Detention Center. Mi Gente is a national membership organization for multiracial Latinx and Chicanx people who are pro-Black, pro-queer, pro-trans, pro-woman, pro-worker, pro-migrant. Through a hybrid offline and online model, Mi Gente moves people, technology, and resources toward transformative change. Our speakers are brilliant individuals and have a lot to share, so let's dive in. I want to begin with Jennifer Lee to just tell us a little bit about the Technology Liberty Project and especially dive in to tell us about the Tech Equity Coalition. Well, thank you, Michelle. Um, and first, it's great to be here with everyone tonight. And I'm so honored to be having this conversation with Michelle, Ashley, Brianna, and Stan, who are absolutely brilliant advocates. Um, to give a little bit of background about the Technology and Liberty Project, it, it encompasses um, one of the many issue areas we work on at the ACLU of Washington. And um, this work focuses on the intersection of technology, surveillance, and civil liberties. The overall objective of the Technology and Liberty Project is to protect and advance people's civil liberties and constitutionally protected rights in the face of game-changing technology. Some key issues and legislation we've been working on include face recognition, data privacy, and AI-based automated decision systems. Um, our key goal in this work is to make technology accountable to people, and particularly the people and communities that have always been disproportionately impacted by surveillance. We do this by pushing for community-centric policies and laws that create safeguards around data and technologies, or advocating for uh, those technologies to uh, be stopped altogether if appropriate. Where existing laws are unjust or have been violated, we conduct strategic litigation with our legal team to remedy harm. And finally, we convened the Tech Equity Coalition to organize with communities and individuals working to hold technology accountable and lift up the voices of historically marginalized communities in decisions about technology. This coalition, the Tech Equity Coalition, is primarily, is primarily composed of individuals and organizations representing historically marginalized communities. But this coalition also includes privacy advocates, technologists, artists, researchers, and many others who all bring tremendous value to our collective advocacy. And just over the past few years, 
This coalition has testified in front of state and local lawmakers, provided public comments to city council members, developed educational toolkits, hosted workshops, and helped draft community-centered privacy legislation. I think what's really important about the work we're doing together is that we emphasize that the harms caused by surveillance, privacy invasions, and unchecked technologies are not new or surprising. Um, and in our conversations with lawmakers and in discussions like the one that we're having right now, we emphasize that at its core, surveillance has been and will always be about power. We encourage people to ask really critical questions about who has the power to watch and police who, with what tools and for what purpose. Um, I'm so pleased to listen um, to the words of our amazing panelists tonight. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Michelle. Thank you, Jen. What a great introduction and how, how clearly stated, right, the, the issue of power. Uh, and one of the things that you also mentioned was uh, uh, that this is not new. Uh, surveillance is not new. It's just the technologies that are new. So it's perfect that I turn now to Stan Shakuma because uh, you actually bring a particular perspective uh, about surveillance tools uh, has, as they were targeted um, toward Japanese Americans during World War II. So I wonder if you would just take a moment to tell us about uh, the organization you represent within the Tech Equity Coalition and share a little bit about the history of surveillance in the Japanese American community. Okay, <clears throat> well, I wanna thank Michelle and Jen and the ACLU for having us here. It's so important that we are able to discuss important issues of civil rights. <clears throat> um, I come representing the Japanese American Citizens League. <clears throat> uh, the JACL is one of the oldest and largest of these civil rights organizations in the Asian American community. It was organized in 1929. Our Seattle chapter actually predates that a bit <clears throat> and we were started in 1921, so we will be celebrating our 100th anniversary this year. How we will do that in COVID remains to be seen, but we're, we're working on different plans. Um, I think when we're talking about surveillance and the Japanese American community, uh, an important thing to think about is that uh, it didn't start with us, <clears throat> but one of the earliest surveillance uses or you know surveillance comes from the French words that say watch over. So it's overwatching, overseeing people. And it's done for <clears throat> many purposes, but generally it's, it's the basic, the bottom line is it's a way of control, power and control over uh, people's behavior, over people's bodies. And one of the worst and earliest examples in this country were the slave patrols. They watched over the slaves to make sure they didn't escape, to make sure that they didn't rebel, to make sure they followed all the myriad rules that were laid out. <clears throat> and that was total control over people's bodies. When we get to the Japanese Americans in the 1940s in World War II, um, surveillance of the Japanese community on the West Coast actually started <clears throat> almost 10 years earlier in the early 30s when the winds of war started blowing and you could they could tell that something was gonna happen both in Europe and in the Pacific. And so they started watching Germans, Italians and Japanese in particular. Um, <clears throat> at that time, there wasn't a lot of technology. You could eyeball it like, you know, stakeouts, have someone hire someone to watch people's storefronts, uh, count how many people went into a, a temple or a church. Um, who went to which banks that were owned by Japanese. Uh, they could take photos, uh, they could tap phones, they could look at written records, you know, bank records, travel documents, uh, newspaper articles. There was, but y'all had to do that in person. You know, you couldn't do it over the phone. There was no internet. One element of mass data collection, however, was they did have IBM punch cards that were used by the Census Bureau. And the annual census or the um, every 10 year census would collect information about where people lived, what 
ethnicity or racial category they were, their income, their sex, their age, etc. And during World War II, the government uh, rounded up 110,000 Japanese, all Japanese on the West Coast, Washington, Oregon, California, and Southern Arizona got rounded up. And it wasn't just 90% of them, of us, or 95%, it was over 99% were rounded up and collected. And that's um, kind of an amazing thing if you think of, you know, trying to collect all the people of a certain descent uh, today, how would you go about doing it? Uh, one of the ways they did it was to go to the census. Um, and that would tell them in a particular area like Chinatown ID, how many, exactly how many Japanese were living there, uh, what ages they were, um, what sexes they were, and that helped a lot. Uh, so you could look at it as a monumental success for data collection and data analysis, but it was also a monumental failure of data privacy. And that type of, and it was also illegal. <laughs> um, but the president, the Congress, the Supreme Court all agreed that because of the, the army's uh, claim of military necessity, that it was okay to do that. And the result of all this data collection, uh, coupled with racism, coupled with conspiracy theories that all Japanese were going to be spies, um, uh, resulted in one of the worst constitutional violations in certainly in the 20th century here, but you know, on a par <clears throat> with what happened to so many other people of color communities. So with that, I'll pass it back to Michelle. Thank you. Um, truly a terrible time in our history and so important to remember. Um, I really appreciate you uh, bringing in the reminder of, of the earliest of surveillance that happened in the time of the slave patrols, right? And so as I turn over to Brianna, um, who is working with CARE with the Council on American Islamic Relations, I'd love for you to tell us about, you know, your connection to the Tech Equity Coalition, but, you know, the moment that uh, it, it really went bad for Muslim communities, of course, was at 9-11. And so I know you have some observations about what was occurring there, again, in the name of, oh, this is for safety. We can, we can break the law or change the law for safety. So Brianna, I would love to hear from you at this time. Thank you so much, Michelle. As Michelle said, um, I'm here representing CARE Washington, which is the Washington State Chapter of the Council on American Islamic Relations which is the largest national Muslim civil rights organization in the US. CARE Washington became, became involved with advocacy on surveillance issues due to the strong history of governments targeting Muslims with surveillance, particularly as Michelle said, after 9-11. And we're active in the Tech Equity Coalition now because the issues are just as prevalent today as they've ever been. And we really want to curtail the harmful uses of emerging technologies before they ever have a chance to harm our communities. So I'm really grateful for the opportunity to participate in that coalition and to speak with you all today and gain some awareness around some of these topics. As Stan explained many times throughout our nation's history, we've seen the most extreme surveillance policies come as reactionary measures in the wake of events or people that this country perceives as a threat. But just like the innocent Japanese Americans in World War II, post 9-11 programs most often targeted Arab and Muslim communities and even communities that were simply just perceived to be Muslim that had zero connection to the 9-11 attacks and who posed no threat whatsoever. But these programs had really serious consequences for their targets. The Patriot Act in particular gave the FBI leave to essentially bypass the Fourth Amendment protections from unlawful searches and seizures to obtain personal information on individuals without a judge's approval and all they had to do was just fill out something called a national security letter. Now with this national security letter, agents were able to obtain phone records, computer and internet records, banking records, and credit histories of US citizens and immigrants and all without a warrant. 
as Michelle said, <laughs> it becomes very easy to rewrite the laws when people are scared. These warrantless searches weren't rare, or they weren't an exception to the rule. In just a three year period, nearly 145,000 of these letters were issued and countless searches, countless warrantless searches, I should say, were conducted on the basis of these letters and not one conviction for anything terrorism related resulted from these searches. But yet the government still could have this data today to this very day, because the act didn't require that any of that data be destroyed, even when its owners were shown to be innocent. And it is also believed that much of this data was used to create the watch lists that are still being used to monitor and limit the movements of many individuals today. Another way that we saw Muslims being targeted by surveillance in the wake of 9-11 was through automated license plate readers. Even a decade after 9-11, the NYPD was using these systems to track license plates of mosque attendees and then would use them to tail their movements throughout the day, throughout the city, supposedly to identify would-be terrorists and move in before they could attack. These programs were not only discriminatory and a huge violation of privacy, but they also severely chilled the free exercise of religion in Muslim communities because community members were so terrified that their mundane innocent actions would be surveilled and determined suspicious that they were afraid to attend their mosques. That's just a few ways that uh, we saw this really proliferate after 9-11. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um... So as we move on <laughs> through our history and how uh, this exercise of power and control really shows up in marginalized communities or communities made marginalized by, by oppressive systems that are in place, I wanna to turn to Ashley and ask you to talk about your connection to the Tech Equity Co Coalition and then particularly how surveillance is showing up in immigrant communities even today. Hi. Um, so as as you touched on, I, uh, I organize with Resistencia um, and Mi Gente. Uh, Resistencia was founded in 2014 with the, the main goal of shutting down the Northwest Detention Center in Tacoma, Washington. Um, for folks that aren't familiar to the Northwest Detention Center or the NWDC is a private for-profit detention center, um, immigrant detention center based in Tacoma, it's run by GEO Group. Um, and our main fight is to shut down that detention center. And eventually we want to stop detention um, and deportation throughout the US. Um, so, and I also organize with Mijente Washington, who we talked about as a pro-Latinx, uh, Chicanx group, um, working to be a cultural hub, uh, teach advocacy and, um, and yeah. Um, so my role with the Tech Equity Coalition is kind of highlighting those community concerns. Uh, so since in like 2003, um, ISIS formation, they've had a role in surveying, identifying, detaining, and deporting all undocumented immigrants. They're responsible for serious human rights violations. Uh, families have been separated. Children have been sexually abused. Refugees have been tortured. Pregnant women have been jailed. That's just some of the atrocities. Um, but ICE can't do their work alone. So they rely on powerful allies like tech companies like Palantir, who has an office in Seattle, Clearview AI, um, both that sell, process, and store data. These tech companies allow ICE to pinpoint the location of immigrants across the country so that ICE can detain and deport them. Um, for example, in 2017, there was a collaborative operation between DHS, ICE, and Health and Human Services. It relied on Palantir to tag, track, and locate and arrest 400 people in an operation uh, that targeted family members of caregivers uh, and caregivers, I apologize, of unaccompanied migrant children. Um, so Palantir is a company that derives their name from, I don't know if any of you are Lord of the Rings fans, the all-seeing evil eye um, in that series. It's a multi-billion dollar tech company co-founded by Trump supporter Peter Thiel. Uh, it was founded the same year as ICE in 2003, and their mission from the very beginning is to know everything about those they seek to track. Um, the CEO, Alex Karpis, said he has a duty to serve the country and he's proud to be working for the U.S. government. Um, and they quickly established contracts with the Pentagon, CIA, um, and Iraq and Afghanistan. So these agencies use Palantir's tech to comb through financial documents, flight reservations, and phone records to show any linkages between the data. 
um, yeah, so their contract with ICE is to provide a tool called investigative case management, and this tool helps ICE agents gather data to build profiles of immigrants for targeting and for deportation. And yeah, that's, I'll pass it back to you, Michelle. Thank you. So we're going to come back to you later to talk about the No Tech for ICE campaign, because I think that that is the response to so much of what you've shared about. But before we get there, I was thinking that we could talk a little bit more about some of the surveillance tools and use cases that we're seeing showing up in all of these communities right now. And so, Brianna, I was thinking I would turn back to you uh, to talk about some of the AI based tools um, that are being used against uh, the communities that you're working with. Yeah, thank you, Michelle. Uh, one of the most recent examples was just this November when we found out that the popular dating and prayer apps, Muslim Mingle and Muslim Pro, which have been used by more than 140 million Muslims worldwide, had been selling their users' data to firms who then sold that data to anti-terrorism contractors for the US military. Then just this month, another Muslim app was found to have sold their user data to ICE. And while the Muslim community is very rarely surprised to find out that they're being surveilled, these ones really did come as a bit of a shock and a particular betrayal because these were apps that were specifically created by and catered to Muslims, particularly for worship purposes, that sold this data. And then after that shock passed, then the fear set in. And I got so many calls from clients who wanted to know what these agencies would be doing with their information and what they could do to get it back. And there was really nothing positive that I could tell them because when you consider that countering violent extremism programs in this country or CVE programs have regularly looked to bogus indicators such as the amount of time someone spends praying per day or the amount of time that they spend on the internet to indicate markers of extremism, then you can imagine that if those markers were programmed into an automated decision system designed to root out would-be terrorists, then you can easily see why the government having access to that kind of data would have really severe consequences for Muslims in the US. And as I'm sure Jen is going to tell you soon, there's really nothing in our current law that would stop that. Ashley, I wonder if there's any particular tools that have that have been showing up in the communities that you're working with that you would speak to. You already mentioned Palantir. I don't know if there are others that you'd like to throw out at this time. Um, you know, there's one that's kind of on our radar. It's the NCTUE. Um, they they compile data from your like your phone records, uh, anything that you pay for, like your utilities, and they they pull that data and they sell it, um, which makes our community members pretty um, uncomfortable with just simple things like paying for their, their utilities. Um, mm -hmm. We're currently putting out an ask to see um, what type of data they're, they're sharing and who they've shared it with. And we have, um, we have some preliminary information that shows that it's been linked to uh, locating and deporting folks. Thank you. So, so Jen, you know, 2020 was quite a year and um, two things that 2020 brought us, one were the coronavirus, right? Um, and then also in the summer, because there was just a particularly horrible slate of police killings, there were many protests, a lot of uh, Black Lives Matter um, movement activity. And I know there were some particular things that arose in those contexts that I was hoping that you could speak to. Sure. Um, you know, first, I really appreciate the example that Sam, Brianna, and Ashley have shared. Um, because they relate so closely to what we're seeing um, as technology is de being deployed in the context of Black Lives Matter protests for racial justice, as well as this uh, COVID-19 pandemic that we're all experiencing today. Um, and that is that surveillance technology is often deployed specifically to harm. But even when they're deployed for seemingly innocuous or even supposedly beneficial purposes, these technologies can so easily be used to harm people's rights and will almost certainly increase structural inequities. One clear example of technology being um, seemingly innocuous technology being deployed to harm people's rights is 
in the summer, when San Diego police looked for Black Lives Matter protesters in records of smart city streetlights, these were streetlights that were intended to contribute to green sustainability purposes, and the cameras and sensors deployed were uh, supposedly to gather pedestrian and vehicle data for city planning purposes. But we found that this footage was collected for um, San Diego police to surveil and indict protesters exercising their constitutional right to protest. With COVID-19, we're seeing the same companies that have partnered with law and immigration enforcement agencies now looking to expand their existing surveillance infrastructures by working with public health agencies. Um, Clearview AI is a company that the ACLU is suing for promoting unlawful privacy destroying face surveillance activities. And that's just one of many companies um, that are pushing for increased surveillance infrastructures. I think what we should keep in mind is that the expansion of surveillance tools is often justified in moments of crises like COVID-19, but such expanded surveillance infrastructure will certainly increase the power of agencies and companies to surveil and harm marginalized communities. I um, really want to emphasize, you know, I, I think Stan, um, Brianna, and Ashley demonstrated so well that the creation and use of technology to surveil and harm marginalized groups is not a new phenomenon at all. Um, but the institutions that continue to oppress and brutalize the lives of Black, Indigenous, and other marginalized communities are now equipped with tools that are truly unprecedented in their surveillance power, like facial recognition, location tracking, drones, and AI-based tools, um, as Brianna was talking about. And if these increasingly powerful, invisible, and unaccountable technologies continue to be built and deployed without adequate consideration of their impacts on communities or without the leadership of community voices, they will continue to exacerbate the structural racism and inequities that are, that are really maggots in our society. Back to you, Michelle. Well, that was really powerful, all of you. And, and I think, Jen, you know, you're spot on. Once an infrastructure is created that allows a technology to be used for a seemingly benign purpose, it seems uh, to be that it, uh, governmental structures are all too quick to convert that to a different use. And because uh, you know, we have a country that is grounded, unfortunately, in uh, institutions and, and racism, uh, uh, it often gets turned against those same communities. So um, that's the reason why you all put together the Tech Equity Coalition and why it's so powerful. So this is exactly the right moment to talk about, all right, so how do you fight back against that? We're not here to hate on technology, but we're here to make sure that people's rights are preserved in the uses and deployments of these technologies. So I know there are a lot of different things that you all have been doing um uh and and trying to give some decision making power back to communities um so um brianna maybe we i can start with you and you could talk about um some of the work with the port uh the port advocacy and i think there's a couple of other things that you might want to address as well here so i'm going to give you the back the floor thanks michelle yeah, one of the ways that we've particularly been looking to push back is by opposing the use of biometrics, particularly by government agencies and in places of public accommodation. And one of the, the major fronts for that right now has been the Port of Seattle. Um, myself as, as a member of CARE Washington and Jen on behalf of the ACLU Washington, along with a number of other civil liberties groups, were invited to serve on the Port's Biometric External Advisory Group where we worked on making recommendations and policies around the use of biometrics uh, in the, the ports of Seattle locations, which would ideally, or excuse me, not ideally, <laughs> wrong terminology, um, which was theoretically anticipated to be used by, by government agencies such as Customs and Border Patrol and TSA, um, by the port itself and by private companies that operate within the ports locations. And uh, the proposed uses for these technologies extended from the use of facial recognition to confirm travelers' identities from their passport photos, or even targeting individuals just passing through an airport with targeted advertising billboards. 
And Jen, myself, and like I said, a number of other uh, civil liberties advocates really, really advocated incredibly hard against any use of, of these types of technologies in these capacities because we, we don't understand the full impacts yet. And what we do know of them is that there are incredible inequities in and inaccuracies, particularly when it comes to racial minorities. Again, these systems are just trained on what we're giving it. So when we have systemic racism, when we have just incredible biases that we're inputting into these machines, those biases are then spitting, or excuse me, those machines are then spitting out the same biases. And so, we advocated quite fiercely to prohibit all uses of biometrics within the Port of Seattle. Um, so far, only one of the use cases has been voted on, and unfortunately that was for use with CBP, uh, Customs and Border Patrol, in which the Port of Seattle did choose to go ahead and facilitate the use of biometrics for CBP um, in areas that are under CBP jurisdiction. We still vociferously uh, disagree with this use, um, but we are now putting our efforts towards trying to advocate against any other uses of biometrics within the ports of Seattle. And there are going to be some hearings coming up open to the public and to which individuals can offer public comment um, that we would love to have people um, offer input on. And we can provide those, those resources for you all that I'm sure Michelle can pass on to you. Um, but we are really, really trying to limit the use of any biometrics technology within the ports, um, but particularly by, by government agencies that we know have been harmful and by private companies that we know often manipulate this, this data and use it to, to harm consumers. So that's one way that, that we're pushing back. And then, um, you know, another way is just trying to make sure that we know what's going on in government agencies, what rules and regulations are being made. And, um, you know, recently during the election, we discovered that USCIS, which is the agency that runs affirmative immigration applications, was trying to push through a rule that would require all uh, family-based immigrant visa applicants and their sponsors, their US citizen and legal permanent resident sponsors to submit biometric data in order for their, their applications to be processed. And we, we tried to collect as many public comments on the record against this policy as we could. Um, it was something that was pushed through in about 30 days and our organization was able to collect 150 plus public comments to to fight that rule unfortunately it's another one that passed but by being on these these policy coalitions and by constantly being in these conversations and tracking what's happening with these government agencies i consider it my job to know what's going on and to let our communities know what's going on so that we can push back because we, we can't just allow these things to be implemented without our consent. So grateful and appreciative of the work that you're doing. And certainly when those port hearings uh, come up that are available to the public, I know we'll be wanting to get those dates and that information on our website. Um, so another piece of this fighting back, right? Like, so there are all these companies that are creating these tools and selling the tools to government. Um, and Stan, you have been uh, really involved in advocating, particularly with Amazon, around the, the face surveillance tools that they've been creating and, um, and trying to uh, get them to voluntarily agree not to sell those tools to the government. And I'd love for you to share about what some of that advocacy has looked like. And I think in particular last year, you got to participate in some shareholder meetings. And so would love for you to share with our folks um, what happened there. Thank you, Michelle. <clears throat> yeah, so with Amazon, we got started about two years ago. And initially it was, uh, uh, when the tech uh, coalition was first forming, <clears throat> we got uh, a sign-on letter and uh, several thousand signatures. We had about 70 organizations and 
We got 40,000 signatures that we were delivering to Amazon to uh, plead with them to stop marketing their facial recognition technology to law enforcement um, because there are so many problems with it, um, as was mentioned earlier, that there's problems with uh, it does. It's not as accurate with people of color. It's not as accurate with as with women than with men. It's not as accurate with young people or really old people. And so there's all these problems with it. But even if it, it was really accurate, um, it's still misused. Um, we've heard stories of police departments um, you know, they're supposed to set their uh, criteria that a 90% confidence level. And Amazon says at that level, you know, there's very few errors, but they couldn't get enough hits. So the police department would lower it to 80 and then it still didn't get enough hits. So they lowered it to 70 or they didn't have a good photo to compare it with. So they would use the artist's rendering from a witness and compare mugshots to what the artist drew, or um, they didn't even have that. So they said, well, you know, the, the suspect looks a lot like Woody Harrelson. So let's use a Woody Harrelson photo from People Magazine. And then they came up with some hits. So there's a lot of um, problems, both with the design, uh, with the specificity, and also with the actual use of it. So we took all this to Amazon. Um, as a result of that, uh, we were able to get a meeting with their lead legal counsel. So about 20 uh, community members from all different organizations met with him. And basically he said, well, it's not really our problem because we're not the ones using it. You know, you need to talk to the ones who are misusing the technology. We just produce technology and technology is, is neutral. So, you know, you should go to the end user or you should go to government if you want regulation, but we have no say and we just sell it and people will use it for good or bad, but it's not our fault. Um, we had a, another meeting with Microsoft who actually has an ethics committee and they were a lot more open and, and willing to listen and, con and showed some concern about the dangers of some of this tech uh, to civil liberties. However, even though they were very sympathetic, they're not the ones that make the decisions on uh, financial decisions, what gets produced, you know, who gets, who it gets sold to. That's marketing, that's sales. That's, you know, the, the C, CEO and the CFO who make those decisions, not the ethics committee. So they might say something, but who will listen is a question. And I think that points to, um, so then we went to Amazon shareholder meeting. We submitted uh, resolutions to the, sh uh, to the shareholders about limiting uh, facial recognition. And we were allowed to come in and make a two minute statement. Um, the board of trustees or the board of directors um, listened and then immediately without discussion voted all the resolutions, shareholder resolutions down. So it's a pro forma act of supposed democracy within uh, the shareholders. But really, since Jeff Bezos owns 51%, he could vote anything down he wanted um, by himself. So with, between him and the board, it was preordained. But I think it really points that to the fact that in the digital age, data is power. And those who own it, control it, are able to access it or prevent others from accessing it, are able to collect it, and then able to sell it, are the ones who really have power within the digital stream. And there is no transparency of who's collecting this data, what they're using it for, who they're going to sell it to. And that's why we need more legislation, regulation, for trying to control that. Thank you. Right. And thank you for that. You know, but I will say that with the, I know that with the shareholder meeting and the statement that you put forward, there was a really substantial coalition of uh, other organizations that uh, participated in that, um, in that effort. And, 
and it is heartening, even though it didn't pass, right, as we wanted it to, it is heartening that there are quite a lot of people, including people who work in the tech industry themselves, who uh, are really uh, fighting back against uh, privacy and surveillance. And, and, uh, and so we're not in this by ourselves. Um, Ashley, as promised, please tell us about the No Tech for ICE campaign. <laughs> Hi, thanks, Michelle. Yeah, um, so how do we fight back? Um, so Mi Gente launched the No Tech for ICE campaign because we saw a need to build a movement for a surveillance-free future. Um, tech companies, as we said, build the tools that surveil, incarcerate, and deport members of our community. Um, so we're working with students, tech workers, and allies to fight back. We created a Take Back Tech toolkit for organizers or anybody who wants to expose and fight surveillance in their city. Um, there's a workshop guide on our No Tech for ICE website, which is notechforice.com. Um, and its purpose is to share what we've learned through our No Tech for ICE campaign to support communities to speak their truth and to organize. That's, uh, there's also what we call the talent to tech pipeline. So locally, what that means is, uh, for example, Palantir, who I talked about earlier, they pay the UW $10,000 a year to be granted access, uh, recruiting access to students right on campus. Um, there's similar contracts that exist between other tech companies and universities, and we wanted to give students a way to fight back for themselves. Um, so we also, with the recent election, um, we have a new administration to contend with. So recently we released five points that we want to, uh, well, I guess more like five uh, demands for the administration. The first one is the stopping of the use of invasive tech companies. Um, that means ending all contracts, agreements, and pilot initiatives with tech companies that build the technology and surveillance programs that lead to DHS enforcement, um, like Palantir, Clearview AI, Vigilant Solutions, and Thomson Reuters. Our uh, second demand is the ban invasive data collection and surveillance. That means strike memoranda, rescind regulations and cancel contracts and or agreements that authorize invasive technologies such as DNA collection, facial recognition, social media surveillance and other biometrics collection. The third is that we restrict utility and essential services data kind of talked about in CTUE earlier. Um, issue memoranda limiting ICE from accessing or using the data of essential or life-saving services like gas, water, internet, and other utilities, health services, or motor vehicle licensing, um, and for immigration enforcement specifically. Uh, fourth point is we ask that they reduce by 50% the DHS surveillance spending. Um, we want them to have the amount of funding requested from Congress for DHS biometrics and surveillance programs and equipment by fiscal year 2021. Um, and the last point is we want to have them conduct a privacy audit of DHS. We want that to, uh, and it's contractors that collect, analyze, share, store, or purchase personality, <laughs> yeah, personally identifiable information for ICE, CBP, and or USCIS, and provide audit results to the public. Um, so this should include requiring DHS to provide a list of all contracts, contractors, use, and monies deployed for surveillance and technologies. Um, I encourage y'all to check out No Tech for ICE. It's got a lot of really great toolkits. Um, and I especially really like the one that helps for, like organizing yourself. That is a really powerful platform. So thank you for sharing with that. So the last thing that we will cover as we're winding up here is at the ACLU, we have uh, an ambitious and strong set of uh, legislation that we're really fighting for. Um, this year and Jen, I was hoping you could talk a little bit about that and maybe also share a bit about how uh, folks who are here and care about this issue can also be supportive of that work. Sure. Um, so currently, with the support of the Tech Equity Coalition, we are working to advance three key pieces of legislation at the state level. The first is a face surveillance moratorium aka a temporary ban on government use of racially biased and inaccurate face surveillance technology, which I should also mention poses enormous privacy threats, even if it's perfectly accurate and is perfectly used. This bill would require that there be a robust and meaningful community driven conversation to decide if not just how face surveillance should be used. And um, the bill number is SB 5104 and is prime sponsored by Senator Hasegawa. Uh, in order for this bill to become a law, it must go through the Senate Environment, Energy, and Technology Committee first, 
and we are continuing to ask the chair to give this bill a hearing. And we would really appreciate people supporting this bill and helping get this bill heard by contacting um, the chair and other lawmakers in this committee. The second bill we're working on is something that I'm super excited about. And this is a community-driven data privacy bill that was co-created with the Tech Equity Coalition. This soon to be introduced bill is called the People's Privacy Act and it's being prime sponsored by Representative Klova. The People's Privacy Act would require affirmative opt-in consent for any company to use your data beyond the primary transaction that you have specifically requested. And importantly, it would allow individuals to sue companies who violate their privacy rights because we need accountability. A bill is meaningless if you don't have a strong enforcement mechanism. This bill would empower people to have control over their information and it is a people-centric alternative to much weaker privacy proposals that we've seen introduced in the legislature um, for the past three years. We would also very much appreciate your help getting this bill heard once it's dropped in the House Civil Rights and Judiciary Committee. Um, we are so excited to be pushing forward a community-driven, uh, people-centric piece of legislation that um, that would really be the strongest uh, privacy law in the US if passed. And the third key tech bill is an AI accountability bill. And this bill would require government to make transparent any machines that are making decisions about people, including decisions about our healthcare, our housing, loans, sentencing, and bail. It's ridiculous that these machines are making decisions about us, but we don't even know that they are, and we have no way to challenge these machines. This bill would also prohibit government from using these machines to discriminate where it's already illegal to discriminate by humans. So it's just saying you can't hide behind a quote unquote neutral machine to discriminate. This bill number is SB 5116, also sponsored by Prime, uh, Prime Sponsor Senator Hasegawa, and we are working on getting it out of the Senate State Government and Elections Committee. You can support this advocacy by emailing, calling, and writing letters to lawmakers in the committees that I just named, asking them to support these bills. You can sign up for action alerts, which you can see on our social media pages um, or sign up for on our website. And you can go to our website to look for information about how to get involved with the Tech Equity Coalition. You can also show your support and amplify uh, these bills by uh, using the hashtag LawLedge or Real Privacy for Law on, on uh, Twitter or other social media. Um, and on a more general note, um, I think that, you know, to fight back, whether we're students, whether we're tech workers, educators, lawyers, organizers, or policymakers, we have to continuously practice sharing our institutional and personal power with historically marginalized communities. As these technologies that we all talked about grow increasingly powerful, it's more important than ever to focus on changing power structures within the different contexts in which we all operate. Everyone has to take on the role of uplifting community voices and ensure that these voices are really leading the conversation and deciding if and not just how these technologies are being deployed. And I'm so grateful to be uh, doing this advocacy in coalition with um, community partners and the Tech Equity Coalition and uh, speaking truth to power, really. And, you know, I think beyond taking these direct actions of emailing and um, calling your lawmakers and writing letters, which is wonderful and excellent and very much needed. I think we also have a responsibility to urge the institutions in which we work to cede decision-making authority to marginalized voices and really practice sharing our power with those who have less. Thanks so much, Jen. And hey, can you clarify something about the People's Privacy Act? We just had a question. Is that being dropped in the House? Yes, it is dropped. Uh, it's being dropped in the House. Our prime sponsor is Representative Kloba, and it's going it's going to go through the uh, House Civil Rights and Judiciary Committee. Great, thank you so much. Well, I uh, I love everything that all of you are doing and the thoughtfulness with which you are doing it. 
um, the care and consideration you have in terms of both the historical context, where we are now, and although you didn't say it really uh, explicitly, um, what it means for the future, right? Technology will continue to evolve and continue to advance. And there are many benefits to it, but what we must be mindful of is the impacts on people, particularly those who have been made marginalized over time through policies or laws or uh, cultural societal practices and uh, the way that you all speak up and speak out uh, for those communities as you are members of them or as you care about them in all the ways is deeply inspiring and extremely important. So I think we are basically at time. So I just want to extend my great gratitude to all of you for hanging out with us this evening. Um, <laughs> and also most importantly for the work that you do. Um, so Stan, Brianna, Ashley, and Jennifer, you're rock stars, you are awesome. So applause from me to you and to our audience. Thank you so much for uh, spending another evening with us which we are always so grateful for your support and all the different ways that you show it. I do wanna remind everyone that we have another Flights and Riots. Our next one coming up is scheduled for March 11th and it's going to be on police accountability. And so you are not going to wanna to miss that. So from all of us at the ACLU, grateful for you, for your continued resilience and for your solidarity, wishing you all a safety, health and good night. <laughs>